My name is Andreas Nitsche. I'm a computer scientist at the Berlin-based Association for Interactive Democracy. My work focuses on the opportunities and challenges of technology for democracy, social cohesion, inclusion and conflict management. The first time I heard about liquid democracy was in 2009. Back in the day, there were many rumors about this American idea. After taking a closer look, I thought this is going to be a game changer for democracy, in particular when it comes to democratic self-organization of large groups. I'm as much interested in the theoretical research as in the practical implementation. I joined a multidisciplinary team for the creation of Liquid Feedback, a free and open source software for democratic decision making. And as the name suggests, Liquid Democracy is one of the defining core concepts. Alongside distinguished researchers and pundits from both sides of the Atlantic, I want to discuss the idea of liquid democracy and its potential for the renewal of democracy. My name is Monty Mwari. I'm currently a senior at Harvard University uh, studying computer science and philosophy. Uh, what got me uh, to look into liquid democracy and uh, meet Andreas was um, this year I was working on a senior thesis uh, in which I was looking at various computational models and philosophical implications of liquid democracy. I'm generally also working as a teaching assistant for CS50, um, which is a Harvard and Yale course on computer science. Hello, my name is Heidi Droshak, and I am a political and government consultant in the United States, specifically on the East Coast and specifically in Virginia. Um, I have been working in government and politics for several years, trying to find new innovative ways for us to bring our government into the 21st century. I'm Nathan Schneider. I'm a professor of media studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, where I direct the Media Enterprise Design Lab, where we explore strategies for bringing deeper democracy and governance and ownership into the online economy. My name is Kristen Sample, and I'm director of democratic governance at the National Democratic Institute. NDI works with partners in more than 70 countries around the world to support and safeguard democratic institutions, processes, norms, and values. We like to say that we work for democracy and we also make democracy work. My name is Marty Kaplan. I'm on the faculty of the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California, where I also direct the Norman Lear Center, which studies and attempts to shape the impact of media on society. I'm uh, Davide Grossi. I'm an associate professor at the universities of uh, Groningen and at the University of Amsterdam. I work in the area of uh, artificial intelligence and in particular, the so-called area of um, multi-agent systems. And uh, my research focuses on, on multi-agent decision-making. So how can group uh, take decisions uh, together? Hi, I'm a PhD student from Berlin. And among other things, I work on the formal analysis of liquid democracy models. Hi, I'm Nimo Talmon. I'm a researcher in the Department of Industrial Engineering and Management in Ben Gurion University in Israel. I do research on uh, computer science and engineering, game theory, combinatorial optimization, mutual decision making mechanism, e democracy, and computational social choice in general. My name is Victoria Spacer and I am an associate professor in sustainability research and computational social science at the University of Leeds in the UK. In my teaching and research, I'm combining different disciplines such as sociology and political science with computer science and data science. My name is Markus Brill. I'm a computer science professor at TU Berlin in Germany. I work on algorithms for collective decision making and I'm leading a research project on how insights from voting theory can inform the construction of digital democracy platforms. My name is Michael Mees. I'm a professor at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. That's a technical university in Germany. And I'm a sociologist. So I, I study human groups, organizations, societies. And in particular, I'm interested in processes of polarization. So processes where a group falls apart into subgroups with opposing opinions. Unfortunately, in much of the world, democracy is not working as it should. According to the Varieties of Democracy program, two-thirds of the world is living under autocratic rule. And even in democratic regimes, the situation is precarious. 
Populist tendencies threaten liberal institutions. Polarization undermines accountability mechanisms. Checks and balances are diminished by executive aggrandizement, and political trust is weakened by infodemics that center on conspiracy theories and online abuse. Against this challenging backdrop, democracy needs a reset. Democracy needs fresh ideas. Democracy needs youth participation. Democracy needs to build trust. Democracy needs to turn down the political temperature. Democracy needs to engage people and political parties in thoughtful, deliberative processes beyond elections. I think democracy is in a crisis. Uh, it might be a fatal crisis. And we are at the turning point in the future of at least the US model of democracy. Uh, and uh, given structural impediments in making change, uh, the feeling that this cannot be stopped is uh, sweeping uh, the most optimistic people. I think around the world, democracy is in a real crisis, and it's a crisis of imagination in many respects. Um, and new approaches like liquid democracy, uh, other emerging strategies for people to participate more deeply, uh, to be able to have finer grain forms of input in the systems that affect their lives, um, are a way for us to reinvigorate uh, that democratic imagination, uh, for people to feel that their choice isn't just be between a failed uh, uh, legacy set of institutions and uh, total aristocracy or, or, or um, authoritarianism of some sort, but instead to recognize that democracy is a, a palette of opportunities and options that we are still uh, only beginning to discover. I got interested in, uh, in liquid democracy and broadly in the problem of democratic decision making, also triggered by in part by a personal experience. Up until a few years ago, I was working in the UK and I witnessed from uh, close by uh, the Brexit uh, referendum and uh, the kind of momentous developments that that caused. And that was for me a moment of realizations in which I, I could see very strongly how a, a political decision could have clear uh, and strong impact uh, uh, even emotionally on, on my daily life. So that for me, that was a moment of recognition of the importance of our democratic system. It actually made me want to contribute to thinking about democratic decision-making and realize that actually kind of the toolbox that I as a computer scientist, as a researcher in AI, could also play a role into broader rethinking of democratic institutions and how they should be probably rethought in order to, to serve society in a better way. I first heard about liquid democracy perhaps uh, three or four years ago, and it really caught my eye from the following perspective. So in computational and social choice, uh, people study voting mechanisms and other systems of mutual decision-making. And there is always an inherent conflict between uh, how expressive um, voters can express the, the opinions and the complexity of the system. And liquid democracy really gives more freedom or expressive power to voters because voters can either delegate their vote to somebody that they trust or consider worthy of their vote or vote directly. There was so much focus on pre-election efforts. So what happens before election day and what happens uh, with the processes that help us choose our representatives. But there isn't, hasn't been a focus on post-election day. So what happens after we elect our representatives and how the governmental process works. Uh, so that work brought me to liquid democracy and this idea of how do we bring, again, the government into the 21st century and bring some of the ideals of direct democracy into the representative process. When I hear liquid democracy, I think of the, um, or I at least have a, like four or so features in mind, which is the uh, direct vote, um, delegation of vote, uh, transitive delegation of vote, and the ability to recall your delegation. So I see those kind of four features as being core to um, the idea of liquid democracy. What got me into liquid democracy is the idea to combine um, direct participation with a dynamic representation. 
That means people have the right to participate through deliberation, through voting, but they have also the possibility to delegate their vote uh, to someone uh, who is then representing them. What I find most interesting about liquid democracy is the flexibility it offers to participants. Like everybody who participates in a liquid democracy process can decide for every issue, do I want to participate directly in decision making on that issue or do I delegate my vote to somebody I trust or to an expert? I think that's a very powerful idea. You know what I find fascinating about the idea of liquid democracy is that there's an immense complexity arising from all these individuals' decision to delegate one's, one's vote. Um, a very complicated tree of delegations can emerge here. Um, and understanding how such structures emerge, that's a typical sociological problem and I think a fascinating research question. From a democratic perspective, I think that the idea of transitive delegations is both natural and appealing. And from a research perspective, there are many interesting theoretical questions that we want to answer in the next years. Yeah, so what, what really struck me as the uh, one of the strongest proposition in uh, liquid democracies is, is the flexibility of, of the representation that it uh, makes possible. And uh, flexible representation means uh, arguably a more responsive one. So a, a representation that can serve in a more effective way. Representation allowed democracy to scale up beyond the scope of ancient city-states it also can be found in almost every large organization. Today, however, people seek more direct influence as citizens, members of their communities, and organizations. But does everyone want to deal with every question? What if people are interested in different areas? The selection of topics in which people want to have a direct say or be represented may differ. A dynamic solution to this dilemma, liquid democracy is a game changer. The basic idea is that voters can delegate their vote to a trustee, often referred to as a transitive proxy. The vote can be further delegated to the proxy's proxy. This builds a network of trust, enabling a dynamic division of labor. Delegations can be set by topic and are revocable at any time. Direct engagement is always possible and will automatically suspend delegations for the given topic. By now, we know what liquid democracy is all about. Participants can decide whether they wish to have a direct say or be represented on a topic. If they wish to be represented, they can do so through topic-based delegations, which are transitive, modifiable, and always revocable. Regardless of delegations, participants can decide to have a direct say at any time. Given all these possibilities, Liquid democracy paves the way for combining the benefits of direct and representative democracy. Basically, you participate in what you are interested in, but for other topics, give your vote to someone acting on your behalf. In order to actually use liquid democracy, it has to be implemented into a practical system for governance. There are several systems that use liquid democracy. To get a deeper insight into the practical application of liquid democracy, let's take a look at one of the best-known implementations, which makes extensive use of transitive proxies. The open-source software Liquid Feedback combines liquid democracy with other core concepts for self-organization to facilitate continuous governance of large-scale groups. The ability to determine the voting options is equally as important as the ability to vote. With that in mind, liquid feedback facilitates a structured deliberation process which identifies the viable voting options by weighing pros and cons, as well as considering alternatives. This also contributes to informed decision-making. Liquid democracy is used for both structured deliberation and voting. Now that we have a glimpse of liquid feedback, let's focus on how it implements the elements of liquid democracy. Liquid Feedback offers many options for setting, changing, and revoking topic-based delegations. Every participant can set a default delegation for an organizational unit, which could refer to a branch of a party, a group, an administrative subdivision, a city, county, or state. Participants can also set delegations for a subject area, such as finances or traffic. 
As long as they exist, area delegations override any existing unit delegations. In this particular subject area, they are used instead of the unit delegation. As soon as a specific issue is discussed, the already existing delegations are applied. However, participants can also set an issue-specific delegation, which precedes all other delegations, but only for this issue. In the end, the most specific delegation is always selected for every issue. Regardless of existing delegations, participants can directly engage in ongoing discussions of an issue. Whenever this happens, any existing outgoing delegation is suspended, unless the participant actively revokes interest in the discussion. At the end of the deliberation phase, liquid feedback determines all the viable voting options and all suspended delegations become active again Participants can directly cast a ballot, in which case their existing outgoing delegations will not be applied while tallying the final votes. With transitive delegations, delegation cycles may occur. At first glance, these cycles can seem problematic, but these delegation cycles automatically disappear as soon as at least one participant from the cycle directly engages in the deliberation or casts a vote. After looking at all these technical details, however, let's turn to the societal impact that liquid democracy could have. You may be asking yourself what the practical value of liquid democracy is. First of all, wherever defined groups decide on issues, it provides an alternative for democratic governance. It could revolutionize democratic decision-making in organizations including key democratic institutions, such as political parties and civil society organizations. Using liquid democracy, political parties and civil society organizations can empower their own members, become more attractive to citizens, and more responsive to the demands of society. As a system, it's an invitation to join a given political party or movement to make politics, in Abraham Lincoln's words, of the people, by the people, for the people. Liquid democracy is all about the vision of labor and mutual empowerment. It supports the self-organization of all factions and subgroups, be they defined by gender, ethnic identity, age, shared interests or values. Considering where power usually amasses, this dynamic scheme of representation may actually support gender equality in a structural way, all the while helping marginalized groups and younger generations. It may also broaden our views on leadership. This is where we want to start our discussion. I assume an important aspect is redefining power structures and, at times, challenging powers that be. Um. Well, so yeah, that would have been what you, if you mean by challenging powers, it'd be, um, it, in my mind is definitely the delegation of voting power as a flexible option in such that you delegating on single areas or general areas. And I think um, that itself is also a very important um, mechanism in liquid democracy that kind of very strongly differs it from representative democracy. Like if we take representative democracy to at least be the current um, traditional democratic norm. Um, I see the very, the way in which it rivals it is really that area specific delegation um, and the instant recall of votes. So I see kind of those two things as being um, important. One problem I think with our current representative systems uh, that we see both in in the level of civil society and in governments um, and even in, in businesses in some contexts is this idea that um, people kind of self-nominate to be leaders, to be trusted voices. And there is a certain skill set around becoming a representative, um, you know, being able to raise money, being able to uh, impress people with speeches that may not be, you know, the the sole skill set that we want to be making decisions and one of the cool things about uh, about liquid democracy is the capacity to 
uh, assign your voice to somebody else who you know and trust, who is a peer, um, rather than someone who has more power than you do already. Um, and that ability to entrust your voice uh, to somebody who is like you, uh, who, who has a skill set that may not necessarily be the same as what would get them elected in a representative system, is a chance to, to bring into power uh, a new set of leaders who may not have even thought of themselves that way in the past. In your opinion, why do people delegate? Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, it, it really depends on how, uh, I mean, optimistically, people are delegating to the person who they believe uh, to vote better than they would vote themselves. Um, and I think the reason to delegate um, for one could be identifying that, another could be that there's a certain uh, burden um, the burden that comes with being informed, the burden that comes with uh, being engaged, I guess, in various different issues. Um, and a voter might be trying to reduce that burden on themselves by delegating their vote. Um, and there, yeah, there might be two questions. It's like, why do people delegate? And then do we think that people will delegate well? <laughs> Or do we, do we have reasons to assume that people can even delegate their votes well? And I I think to that second question, there are a couple ways in which, um, at least in the uh, philosophical literature, like in the um, field of social epistemology, there are a few reasons given uh, as um, why you might think that someone, a novice, would be good at picking um, or having a justified belief in an expert's opinion. Um, And often those are like as follows of observing the way they uh, present their arguments and debates and defeat points presented against them, um, how they, um, the credence they're given by their peers, by other experts, and how much support they have from the people around them, their track records of how their previous opinions and previous assumptions, like there are various ways in which you can um, indirectly identify your beliefs or people to delegate well. This makes a lot of sense. Although I believe social choice theory suggests that the ability to determine the voting options is equally as important as the ability to vote. Yeah, I, I agree. That's uh, an interesting point, um, especially with, you, you know, ideally, as people would have Uh, these increased flexibility in the way that they're able to vote, they would also have uh, flexibility in the way they're able to determine the options that are up for vote too. Um, and that is equally as important as allowing this more flexible vote because, you know, putting a certain decision in a binary dilemma or amongst a certain set of options can really make an option appear to be, I guess, more compelling in certain senses. So it would also be important to have a strong Uh, deliberative or um, debate platform. Yeah, so the, of course, the key of democratic decision making is to reach uh, as a society, as a, as a collective, a decision. So to reach an outcome uh, to to uh, that could concern policy making. But uh, and that's of course that's uh, that's what has to happen. On the other hand, we forget that. Uh, what democracy really is about is also to ask uh, the right questions and to so what what a proposition like liquid democracy uh, uh, can make possible is to democratize also the uh, uh, the production of those questions so to allow citizens to set the agenda in a democratic way and that's essentially the key of deliberation and that's what uh, also I see at the heart of the liquid democracy proposition. Liquid democracy can be implemented in, in, in multiple parts of a democratic process, in multiple phases. One is, of course, the voting. Yeah, You can um, either, either vote yourself uh, or you can delegate your vote to someone you trust, someone you, you consider competent in, on a certain, in a certain field. Um, But you can do much more than this because what you have in such a voting system is just the, the final decision. 
The question is, where do these different options come from? Where do the, the solutions that people have proposed come from? And this is also part of a democratic process. It's a, a, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, that's what we call deliberation. People meet, they, they form their own opinions, they form their own stances, they realize, hey, this is my view on something, this is the initiative I support. And they also contribute to improving different initiatives and coming up with new initiatives. And also in this process, liquid democracy can be implemented because, yeah, I, I can participate myself in, in, in such a process of deliberation, or I can ask someone to do it for me. Or, yeah, delegate my um, my contribution to to such a process to someone that I trust or some, someone where, where I feel that person has the right expertise to 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 participate in that process for me. So the idea of liquid democracy can be implemented in the whole deliberation process too, not just the voting process. I couldn't agree more. We also need to democratize the generation of the voting options, and we can accomplish this by a structured deliberation using liquid democracy. Everything else would be half-hearted. Deliberation that is pondering pros and cons and considering alternatives contributes to an understanding of the more often than not complex nature of a given issue, to informed decision-making and ultimately good governance. And this already brings us to our next topic, potential use cases for governance using liquid democracy. Liquid democracy allows high-frequency, high-stake decisions to the point of full democratic governance. On the other hand, we can only observe liquid democracy and study how it works if there is something at stake. Yes, I definitely agree. Uh, if we want to experiment with these new uh, democratic decision-making methods like liquid democracy, it should be clear to participants that um, they, they take part in the process where something important is at stake. So uh, the decision they take uh, matters and it is important. That cannot be just uh, be a, you know, yet another survey that is submitted to participants. It has to be something that has meaning for their lives. And uh, yes, actually, while, while saying this, uh, it brings, this brings to my mind that uh, one could experiment with the liquid democracy, even in, uh, in the governance of institutions like universities. If uh, a university community uh, could, uh, could participate in the decision-making of their institutions through uh, a system like uh, liquid democracy, ranging between the kind of day-to-day -day business of the little kind of things on the work floor, but to hopefully even the more, more kind of strategic uh, or high stake decisions that could have an impact on you know, individual careers, or more broadly, even the direction that a university can take strategically in, in, a, in a mid to long time horizon. So and now that I think about it, uh, maybe we should experiment with liquid democracy in a, in a university context. And once in a while, you may find that there is an expert on a very specific issue who you would have never thought about. Indeed, those, those that would be maybe on, on many, many aspects of day-to-day -day business of universities, maybe those are exactly the people that would not would never be picked to be part of a committee uh, that has to decide on what new forms to use uh, for a specific um, uh, teaching activity or to request budget for something or something else. Indeed, like the, 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 the ability to pick the right representatives, that's, that's, the, that's the key. In the cooperative business tradition that I've been studying and engaged in for, for many years now, um, this is particularly exciting because one of the things that's been lost in a lot of cooperative businesses is the recognition of the power of lateral relationships among members. Um, so many big established cooperatives have gotten used to just thinking of, them, of themselves as businesses that interact with their member customers. Um, and these kinds of opportunities where members have the ability to actually hand power to each other when they trust one another um, is a way of reclaiming uh, that superpower of cooperative business, which is uh, lateral relationship, lateral trust and, and solidarity. Are you aware of American cooperatives applying liquid democracy for full governance? Uh, not a... Not at uh, not in the cooperative context. It's um, but it's something that I've 
encouraged. Um, and it's something that I would like to see. I think you're absolutely right that it's a, a natural extension of the um, of the kind of of the the kind of core unit of group decision making, which is something like a kind of group consensus or you know full participation of everybody. When you get to a scale where you can no longer do that, which is very natural, um, you know, in, in in many respects, delegation um, and 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 the kind of flexible delegation that liquid democracy allows is the natural next step. Now, in our history. Um, we've opted for kind of static representatives um, for practical reasons, right? That we don't have the kind of information flows that can allow more flexible, more dynamic uh, assignments of, of authority. Um, because, you know, if someone had to take a st stagecoach for three days in order to get to the Capitol to vote, you know, that you, you, you can't get the kind of feedback mechanisms that you need in order to do more than just send that person to make make the decisions for you. But when you are getting real time feedback on what's going on at the Capitol, um, and you can reassign your, your delegation very easily um, with a click that's instantly registered, um, you know, we should have the capacity to be um, much more, uh, more flexible in that respect. There was, for instance, here in, in Boulder, Colorado, a, a candidate who ran for mayor of, or for, excuse me, for city council a few years ago, who was proposing to vote that way, to vote as, as his constituents um, uh, through a liquid democracy system uh, would tell him to, to vote. Um, you know, it was, a, it was too new of an idea uh, for for the moment, I think people really need to get their hands on, have experiences with these kinds of processes, realize that they're they're very sensible, and 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 wrap their heads around what it what it means for them to participate in this sort of thing. Um, and you know, I I think that will open people's minds to this kind of involvement. Montague, if I got you correct, you see liquid democracy first and foremost in a societal setting. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be correct. Or, or at least um, the way I'm investigating it, uh, both in the research I'm doing and both personally, I, I think it makes the most sense as a full system of government that um, it isn't just used for voting, though I do see a compelling um, historical and um, traditional norms uh, reason to just use it for voting within a traditional like government system um, to not completely like rewrite all of the the policies and the historical institutions that have been built up around that. But yeah, I, I see it as at least in the abstract in a in a in a abstract sense it is different. I see it as being in between direct and representative democracy. Oh, for sure. I would even see it stretch all the way from direct to representative democracy, allowing everyone to choose their own way. But it's not only on the societal level that we see representation and governance. It's also within organizations, including political parties. So my first idea would be improving the way key democratic institutions are governed, as opposed to changing the structure of a state. My other question would be, how would we get from A to B? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I I couldn't, uh, with any credence, say a good way that I think to roll out liquid democracy in um, different ways. But I, I will say what initially interested me, uh, particularly in the, the computational work as opposed to a lot of the empirical work, was uh, exactly that feature is it, it really seems like if you were to use liquid democracy in a very specialized organization, like if it was a community of doctors and they're using liquid democracy, it would seem in that case that most of them would vote directly and probably should be engaged, I guess, at, at least most decisions that are concerned in that uh, smaller community. Um, so yeah, it, it really seems like the biggest um, thing to gain and uh, at least what I'm uh, would also be interested in seeing is how this works at scale in which you have a very large population in which there is a very vast difference between what um, the average person maybe understands and what the medical expert and public health expert would understand about a problem. 
um, and likewise for other fields and for various domains where the, you know, I think liquid democracy in some ways thrives in an environment that the problems are very complex, such that you don't have many people who are even possibly qualified to vote on everything. I hear you. But wouldn't liquid democracy raise questions such as, do we need to readjust the system of checks and balances? How can we ensure consistency? And would we have to build up an overboarding bureaucracy to handle this? Uh, yeah, I've, I've seen that, um, yeah, at least in some of the, uh, in one in particular, in the philosophical um, paper by Blum and Zuber, they, they mentioned kind of those two problems, or at least the problem of policy and consistency, um, for which I, their proposal was to kind of, as you said, like have a, a board of overseers or have some kind of um, maybe like budgeting overseer who controls the budget and how you allocate um, at least the resources between very inconsistent, potentially inconsistent experts voting in very different fields. Um, and that, that seemed pretty compelling to me. But yeah, I agree there is... Uh, at scale, at like a very large scale. And as you said, I think I also agree that even within um, a party is, even within a smaller group of people, it's not necessarily the more people I'm more referring to, like the range and complexity of the issues that would cause people to take advantage of this type of flexible delegation. Um, the more you have that, the more you would also need some type of um, additional uh arbitrary in some sense features that are making sure that you your policies are consistent that no one's overrunning the budget in a certain proposal um no one's overrunning the budget that interferes with other proposals that um people are at least in dialogue with each other about how to weigh certain priorities in different areas um and there are a bunch of issues, I think, too, with just pure democratic voting, with how do you protect the minority, the like statistical minority right, um, and how to protect like people's fundamental rights and how it interacts with the Constitution and etc. cetera. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of bureaucracy that would be needed in addition, um, as with any system. Heidi, you champion the use of liquid democracy for robust channels between lawmakers and their constituents. What is the idea behind that? If a legislator has, let's say, an average of 80,000 constituents, you can't typically expect 80,000 people to weigh in on any given issue, but there are typically a couple hundred to potentially a couple thousand individuals who do really care about that issue. And having a forum like this where citizens know that they can plug in when they feel it's necessary and in the rest of the time delegate their vote to someone else or to their representative themselves. Um, I think could be really powerful because currently our channels are extremely outdated. If you want to say something to your legislator, you may send them an email, you may call them uh, and get stuck on a log somewhere, but there's very few opportunities to actually speak with your legislator and express your opinion in a very direct fashion. And so I think creating channels like this where a legislator can turn around and ask for a response and then get a, you know, a robust response from even a couple hundred or a couple thousand citizens could create so much more of a lively conversation that that legislator can then take to the full legislature. Looking at civic participation in the context of a representative democracy, there are certain factors which trigger an increase in the participation rate. The importance of the decisions, bindingness of the participation process, and the degree of dissatisfaction with the lawmakers. So this is certainly nothing you want to optimize. No. You don't want to infuriate people just for the sake of more participation, because that would feel like a Pyrrhic victory. Yeah, and this was this was a giant aha moment for me, because most of the conversation in America and in the political space right now is that it's how do we increase civic participation? How do we get everybody involved in the government structures? And so for a long time, I. I was one of many and almost everyone in the political space who viewed that as the goal. Like you said, it was, how do we get as many people as possible involved in the system? But exactly, in a representative system, that's actually the wrong metric because if you're doing it correctly, 
you don't need that many people involved in the system because the people who you've chosen to represent you should actually be doing, again, they're the professional legislators who you've hired to do the job. So I, I, I do exactly. It's, it's, it was an aha moment for me to say civic participation for the sake of civic participation is not actually the goal. The goal is to create channels so that when civic participation is necessary, it's easy to do and it's very easy for representatives to be aware that it's happening. And so it, it's a shift because it, it's a totally different goal, but I think it's a very important one because a lot of times civic participation, high numbers of civic participation can actually mean the opposite. It means that your system is failing and the people are so frustrated that they're now getting involved because it's basically a last ditch effort. So, and that's not always the case, but I do think it's an interesting shift of perspective because it totally changes the goals and the tools and what you're working on, but I think leads to a healthier democracy. Victoria, you're considering the use of liquid democracy in thematic citizen assemblies. This is very different in nature from constituency participation. In my current research, I am interested in how we can activate the public to demand and support um, meaningful climate change policies that would actually lead to the stabilization of the Earth's climate by 2050. And in this context, I have been following um, different climate change assemblies around the world. And of course, uh, these climate change assemblies represent an example of direct democracy, where people are informed on the matter, so they get um, presentations from experts to learn about climate change and about the different policies on climate change. They can then deliberate those different uh, climate change policies, and then they can make the decision uh, on which climate change policies they would support. Now, typically those climate change assemblies involve always um, only a very small group of people. For instance, in the UK, only 108 people were involved in this uh, climate change assembly. However, I think because climate change is such a big issue and because we need to get everyone on board with the necessary changes um, to make sure that we can stabilize our climate, um, I think it is important to scale this up, to get many, many more people involved in this deliberation and decision-making process. And here I think um, liquid democracy and particularly the way how it is implemented in platforms such as liquid feedback can play an important role to facilitate that, to facilitate this wider participation in this process of decision-making. And I think delegation uh, could play here an important role because again, um, not all climate change policies will be of interest to all people and they will be not affected by all climate change policies. So people can then decide to get involved directly in those questions that matter to them, that actually would affect them while leaving the other policies to those who, whom they trust. In this context of um, climate change assemblies and how we could potentially use liquid democracy and liquid feedback um, in, um, in climate change assemblies context, I'm also interested in the question how we can get experts involved. Because in the climate change um, assemblies that so far have taken place, the experts played a crucial role. They, of course, provided a crucial information about climate change, but also about you know, different um, types of policies that could be implemented. And so trying to get them involved in this process uh, of liquid democracy process of deliberation and decision-making delegation is, is quite important. Now, um, liquid feedback, for instance, um, has the possibility to um, give people externals, such as experts, um, expert accounts, where they can get involved, for instance, by you know, providing information, by um, you know, providing ideas and suggestions without having the right to vote themselves. So that could be one potential way how we could get experts involved in this deliberation process. Uh, my hope is that people um, recognize that a lot of the stuff that is right now being done for them is something that they can have a, a profound stake in. Um, and that requires having experiences uh, with that power, with that stake. Um, I hope that in the future, um, people sharing power, having power, and participating in decision making and in implementing those decisions is just um, a part of life, um, is something that we, uh, we entrust ourselves with, and that we trust ourselves more than we trust you know, loudmouth leaders. 
right now we're in a time both in our business worlds and in our political worlds where we are putting a lot more trust in loudmouth leaders than I think they deserve. And, and I don't think that's just because they're really good at being loudmouths or because of social media or something like that. I think it's because we've lost a lot of faith in ourselves um, and we've lost also capacity um, and not just lost, in, in many respects, we've never had it. Um, we need to really step up our capacity to self-govern um, to meet our expectations um, for ourselves. Well, there's no one size fits all solution or panacea. Liquid democracy is a promising approach for many reasons. First of all, it allows citizens to participate and make their voices heard on policy issues and decisions rather than waiting years for an election to exercise their vote. Also, the ability to delegate a vote means that not all citizens have to be experts on all issues, and it helps to generate cooperation, cohesion, and trust between citizens and their, and their chosen delegates. The online dimension makes liquid democracy accessible and inclusive to people across traditional divides. While the practical application of liquid democracy arguably didn't start before the year 2010, there's already a longer history. And to a large extent, this is an American story. In this transatlantic debate, we also want to recognize the American roots of liquid democracy. As early as 1884, to determine the outcome of multi-winner elections for the House of Representatives, English writer and mathematician Lewis Carroll proposed allowing candidates to transfer excess votes to another candidate. The elector must understand that, in giving his vote to a candidate A, he gives it him as his absolute property to use for himself or to transfer to other candidates, or to leave unused. If he cannot trust the man for whom he votes, so far as to believe that he will use the vote for the best, how comes it that he can trust him so far as to wish to return him as member? Lewis Carroll was probably the first person to propose empowering candidates to transfer their received votes, an idea that is is arguably a precursor of liquid democracy. Most of the ideas that comprise the fundamentals of what we now call liquid democracy were developed in the United States throughout the second half of the 20th century. In 1967, Gordon Tullock proposed a hybrid of direct and representative democracy. With modern electronics, there is no necessity for all representatives to meet in the same hall. Consequently, there is no maximum on the number of representatives. Voting could easily be done by wire, and the proceedings could be broadcast. In the extreme case, there seems no reason why people who wish should not vote for themselves and then fill their days by casting their single vote for and against the various proposals. Tulloch was aware of the revolutionary and visionary nature of his proposal. New ideas always seem radical and bizarre. I would not claim that the new ideas I have advanced in these essays are the best possible suggestions. I hope, however, that they will play at least some role in the search for a better and more scientific political structure. In his 1969 publication, James C. Miller proposed a program for direct and proxy voting in the legislative process. Instead of electing representatives periodically for a tenure of two years or more, why not allow citizens to vote directly or delegate proxy to someone else for as long as they like? If people were to choose to delegate, their delegations would be revocable at any time. The representative would be subject to instant recall by each and every voter. Such recall would be on a day-to-day -day or even hour-to-hour -hour basis. Miller also considered the idea that voters may decide whether to vote directly or via proxy on a per-topic basis. Most voters would utilize some combination, voting on major issues personally and delegating proxy to someone else for the minor decisions. Thus, the third feature of the proposal is a provision for proxy as well as direct voting. The ideas from the 1960s reappeared on the internet around 1995. Proposing a model for electronic democracy, Rob Lanfear described the concept of a public ballot stewardship with so-called stewards. These stewards are, in the terms of liquid democracy, what we would call delegates today. He proposed the ability to change a delegation at any time. 
For particular decisions, he proposed, one should also be able to override the delegation temporarily and vote directly. Along with Miller, Lanfear also proposed to allow different delegations for different topics. Maybe, instead of one body, there could be several Congresses, each with assigned powers of their own. One Congress dedicated to the interior, one to defense, one to education. People could pick individual stewards for each, or choose one to handle all. Perhaps this would be done on an individual basis, where the steward has trusted advisors that actually choose the vote in their given specialty. Lanfear's notion of trusted advisors could be seen as a precursor to what was later proposed as the transitivity of delegations in the 2000s. In the early 2000s, both Brian Ford and James Green Armitage picked up the previous ideas on delegations and proposed different concepts for democratic systems. Both expressly added the idea of transitivity of delegations to the previously existing proposals. One reason this might be good is that it would allow voters to indicate as proxies people who are knowledgeable in the field that a specific issue relates to. For example, if the issue is relevant to ecology, then a voter might indicate an ecologist as their proxy for that issue, or a staff member at an NGO that deals with the environment. Or, rather than being a matter of a field of study, a voter may delegate his vote to someone whom he knows has educated themselves well about that issue in particular. For example, if the issue is choosing between different versions of a trade bill and the voter knows someone who has read all of the different versions personally, even if most voters would not know such a person, their proxies and their proxies' proxies might. Both Green Armitage and Ford added the last piece of the puzzle. By adding transitivity, all defining properties of liquid democracy then became part of the scientific debate. People can decide whether they wish to have a direct say or be represented on a topic. If they wish to be represented, they can do so through topic-based delegations, which are transitive, modifiable, and always revocable. Regardless of delegations, people can decide to have a direct say at any time. This is what we call liquid democracy today. Liquid democracy continues to fascinate the international scientific community and many citizens around the world. Scientists from fields as diverse as sociology, mathematics, and philosophy are intrigued by the potential of liquid democracy to create a better society. In my own work on liquid democracy, I'm exploring ways of how to make liquid democracy even more flexible by allowing participants to delegate to multiple other participants rather than only one. This then leads to the question how to resolve delegations in a fair and efficient way. My research on liquid democracy has broadly focused on two topics. First one has been to look at liquid democracy through the lens of so-called wisdom of the crowds effect. A key argument for liquid democracy is the ability to find experts in a kind of fluid and unexpected manner. And this expertise arguably uh, is something that should have an impact on the choices that uh, a group makes using liquid democracy. Another topic uh, I've been working on is how one could quantify more precisely, more exactly, not only the power of ultimate voters in the system, which uh, can be quantified in a standard manner using systems that, um, and tools that are already known from voting theory, but also the power of delegators, because the possibility of recalling uh, delegations is a key is a key aspect in, in the liquid democracy system. And it is the aspect that gives power uh, to delegators. So my research on liquid democracy centers around the point of expressive power in the sense that I want to find even better ways of using the idea of liquid democracy to give voters uh, enhanced flexibility in expressing their opinions. So in particular, I'm very interested in trying to push liquid democracy even further for more complex types of decisions and to allow people to delegate parts of the vote or specify more fine-grained operations or instructions to the central mechanism. So, for example, people 
would be able to vote directly or delegate part of their decision to, say, a group of other voters, and they're combined, they can make the joint uh, decision. Personally, I'm interested in extensions of the classical liquid democracy model that give even more expressive power to the voters. For example, how can we define well-behaving models to allow voters to state multiple approved delegates instead of only one? Generally, when I'm uh, looking at liquid democracy, it's been looking at the uh, the voting mechanism mentioned in the literature of computational social choice. Um, the implications, though, of that uh, are related to the various softwares, um, such as liquid feedback, that actually implement uh, a practical liquid democracy that can then be used for empirical research and the like, um, as well as actual like political uh, systems. We see that in, in this whole field of yeah, deliberation research, but also yeah, the construction of uh, liquid democracy, the communication of arguments plays a critical role. The idea is that we, we try to find better solutions to, to problems by talking about uh, different aspects, by communicating arguments, by deliberating about them. Um, and now my question is, how can we do this in a way that we don't increase opinion polarization? And there are actually some, some really puzzling questions here. So um, what we see in our models, for instance, of polarization is that uh, opinions can polarize if, uh, if leftist people meet in a bubble and rightist people meet in a bubble. Yeah? And then you have this, this, this filter bubble uh, 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 effect that people in each bubble grow more extreme and opinions polarize. Um, what you do in, in liquid feedback, for instance, is you, you build such a world. Yeah, you, you, you invite people to, to propose uh, initiatives and then ask them to, to, if you like an initiative, to contribute to elaborating it. And if you don't like that initiative, you are asked to, to propose a counter initiative. So in a way, you're building these bubbles. And you have good reason to do that because you've learned that this works. This makes the debate uh, yeah, more successful, more fruitful. So something is contradicting each other here. Yeah? So you see in, in, in your world that uh, uh, building such yeah, bubbles or yeah, keeping people with really opposing opinions kind of apart helps the whole process, makes people more satisfied with solutions, leads to better solutions. We see in our research that this is increasing polarization. So there's something that you do in, 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 in the way you implemented uh, de deliberation that is not leading to polarization. And this is a wonderful question. This is what I actually want to find out in the next years. Democracy appears fragile and our societies are increasingly polarized to the point of segregation. We also need to discuss the prospects of liquid democracy against this background. Let's start with a $1 million question. In today's America, is there still a chance for fact-based bipartisan cooperation? Yes, but I don't think it will be easy. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, our citizenry and our legislature is interested in that. Um, you're noticing a fatigue probably even abroad. Uh, the American citizens are becoming very, very frustrated with the legislative process and the fact that in a lot of ways it does not reflect what the people of the United States want. Um, but I also think you're wrecking or you're seeing a fatigue amongst legislators. Um, legislators are becoming, it's becoming increasingly difficult to legislate and bipartisan solutions, common sense solutions are becoming more and more rare. And I think that's just as frustrating to legislators as it is to citizens. The incentive structures, the electoral process, so many things will have to reform, but more than anything, we have to give legislators the tools to do it. Um, because doing it in back rooms and being buddy buddy and you know old friends like the way a lot of bipartisan compromise happened in the past isn't realistic anymore. And so I think we need 21st century tools to create 21st century uh, bipartisan solutions. I believe we sometimes forget that conflicts are actually something healthy in a democracy and that a certain level of polarization can be a driving force behind good solutions. So we may even find strength in political difference. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's also something that culturally is going to have to change in America. Okay. In general, we become very averse to conflict. And that's, you know, you see that on a personal level. People don't want to talk about politics anymore. Um, 
you've seen it on a political level. Politicians don't want to talk about complicated issues. You've even seen it just, like I said, on a cultural level. Our society is becoming very bifurcated. And so I do think that that is going to have to change at every level. I think, you know, academically, culturally, personally, politically, we have to exactly recognize that conflict can be a very good thing and that there are some very big issues facing the United States. And we may disagree on how that, uh, how exactly to solve each of those problems. But at the end of the day, they're simply that. Once we can move beyond that, we'll be a stronger country. Sure. So we uh, actually, it's it's a building stone of democracy. Yeah? If there, if everyone agrees, we don't need to debate. And there, there is no reason to meet at all. So you want to have some opinion diversity. Also, uh, we, we know from a lot of research that diversity makes groups creative, more inspirational. You find better, uh, better solutions if, if people disagree, at least in, initially. So you want to have some diversity also in opinions uh, in, in a democracy. But we also see that if these differences grow too big, then very often people start identifying with certain groups and start hating the other group. And then deliberation is not possible anymore. How do we build a world that we have healthy levels of polarization? Yeah, healthy levels of opinion diversity, where it's high enough to find good solutions to be creative, but not too high to still have a fruitful debate. In the face of the growing tribalism, I believe we have to consider unlikely or maybe even inconvenient alliances with all those who stand for the rule of law. Yeah. And I think in America, we unfortunately on both sides of the aisle, I think on the left and on the right, we have supported an entire group of politicians whose whole stand is to say, I'm simply against what these other people say. Um, and so it's, I agree with you. I think a lot of what's going to have to happen is, you know, unlikely bedfellows and people who have very different views of the world and very different priorities coming together and saying, okay, how can we work together? But it is very difficult because a huge swath of our p politicians and our political infrastructure is built on people saying, I will not compromise because I am right, or I was elected because I am standing up against so-and-so. And that's a very difficult place to meet in the middle. And so I always tell people it's not sexy to elect politicians that are moderate and bipartisan and are willing to work together. But if we actually want to see the country move somewhere, that's who we have to start incentivizing as politicians. Because someone who screams and just tells you that the government's terrible is, is probably not going to make a great part of the government once they get there. Um, and again, I don't think that's one part or the other. I, I honestly see it on both sides of the aisle, but I think that that is on the citizenry to start incentivizing the people with the right view and the willingness to work together and the willingness to problem solve into office so that we can actually start seeing that happen. In order to go forward, I believe we need to operate on the same facts. And of course, liberals and conservatives will come to different conclusions and champion very different remedies. We are in what has often been called, and I agree with it, an epistemic crisis. Uh, uh, the, the consensus that is lost is not a consensus on political grounds, which should be a series of changing coalitions reflecting uh, shifting points of view and, and so on. Uh, it's fine if we don't have a consensus there, but we do not have consensus on the way in which one establishes any facts from which to operate. Instead, the way is what my side believes, what is said in my bubble. And because it's an echo chamber, the more times I hear it, the more true I think it is. I think we need to avoid self-isolation in our own comfort zones where liberals don't even talk with well-meaning conservatives. Um, I think that is true. And all the patterns of uh, where people live, for example, demonstrate that kind of self-segregation. Uh, one of the challenges of liberals and conservatives talking to each other is that there is no, disagree no agreement about common facts not even agreement that there are such a thing as facts and evidence and things can be proven or disproven. They are taken as aspects of tribal identity and you can't ask people to choose between what's true and who they are. 
So built built into the system right now is uh, uh, that kind of uh, desire to be with like-minded people. So it, this is a hypothesis that you also find in the in, in the literature a lot. That's very, also very recently. So this is what people observe in the U.S. right now. Uh, apparently, it very often doesn't matter whether you you agree with someone or not. If this person is from the other camp, then you just disagree automatically. Um, and yeah, so if you have a situation like this, you are in big trouble. If if people don't consider arguments anymore, if uh, if people are not uh, yeah think about what is my actual opinion, they they are just countering what the other side is thinking. Um, that will not lead to a fruitful debate. And the big question is how to overcome such a situation. When civic participation or civic unrest or civic displeasure arises, there are tools that allow that to reach representatives very quickly, very concisely, and very factually. Instead of being nuanced or, like I said, societal feelings, it should be able to reach the representatives and say 10% of your population is displeased with your decision and here's why and here's how you correct that. On the other hand, I think that that channel also has to flow the other way. I think legislators and the government has to do a better job of informing the populace of what they're doing so that when civic participation is required, it's much easier to do. In, in my hopeful future, those lines of communication will flow both directions. And that is from the government to the people and the people to the government, not for the sake of everyone being involved in government, but for the sake of having a, a well-run system that, like I said, isn't interested in bipartisanship or personal interest, but is interested in solving problems. Because I think at the end of the day, that's really all we want. We just keep getting tripped up on all of these different aspects. And when we can bring it back down to just solving problems for the sake of creating a better country and a better world, we'll be in a much better place. Absolutely. And lawmakers need to explain certain aspects of politics, even if they take them for a given. A striking example for me is that many Americans don't see any value in multilateralism. I assume many politicians in Washington don't see an immediate need for bringing this to the yes. public's attention, but at the same time it allows framing and false narratives and leaves the society more vulnerable to populism. Yes, and, and I think and my favorite example is even our tax structure. In the United States, everyone views paying tax, I shouldn't say everyone, but a majority of people view paying taxes and it, as an extreme burden and a frustration. and we don't view it as paying into the system that then gives us back a bunch of rewards. And I think in a lot of ways, it's exactly what you just explained. It's not necessarily because we don't get rewards. There's an enormous amount of things that come from the federal government, but it's because it's never, nobody's ever bothered to explain it to the average American. But I think when we can start to open up those channels and say, this is why this is happening, or we, you know, even some of our biggest problems, if we can just say, look, Social security is going to be a problem and we need to fix it. And it's not about, you know, somebody's trying to take something away from you. It's just a problem that we as a country need to solve. Then we can have a real conversation about it. Do you think there's a problem in political communication? Can politicians even afford to tell the truth? One thing that comes to my mind is Walter Mondale's famous promise to raise taxes. I think that was uh, then and this is now. Uh, I mean, it, it, it used to be, uh, the mythology was, if you tell the truth to people, they will welcome it because that means you're authentic. You're not going to lie uh, to them. And the lesson most people draw from uh, Mondale's confronting the deficit and the need to raise taxes and being defeated for it was that no, that's a bad strategy and you can't tell the truth. However, uh, in the present, uh, and we've headed steadily here, um, uh, the truth has no constituency at all because the truth has no meaning across the board. And so people just shout at each other and the only thing public can do to understand what the truth is, is to ask, well, what does my tribe say is true? And so someone telling the truth, in fact, is instead often lying but the lie is my tribe's lie. So America's missing someone like the late John McCain? Yes, yes indeed. I recall his basic decency protecting Obama against uh, defamation on the campaign trail. 
Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, McCain has always been very supportive of me and my work, uh, even though we are on different sides of the aisle. Um, uh, in our work to try to reform uh, the TV uh, coverage of politics, what he was fighting and what we're fighting is the trivialization of politics or the ignoring of politics at a certain level in television. Uh, coverage because it's deemed to be not interesting enough, except for White House scandals. And we had, he and I, consensus about that. In order to be capable of fact-based deliberation, citizens need information on important issues rather than interesting but unimportant details on celebrity and crime. Do even mainstream media pay attention to the wrong things? So news media uh, are not monolithic. And so the first challenge is to distinguish different kinds of news media. Ironically, they all share one thing in common, which is the need to capture attention. And if you ask what captures attention, the answer goes back to our primitive brain stems. It's things like fear and sex and scandal uh, and uh, playfulness and those things mean that the kinds of stories that are featured uh, uh, emphasize that. And the topics that uh, deliberators uh, should engage with are often complex and don't lend themselves to interesting stories. And so in a, a world in which profit is the number one goal of the media makers, with a small exception in the US model of publicly funded news media. Uh, unlike most uh, European nations, ours is a very anemic system. Because profit is the motive, then that drives scandal and outrage. Disinformation and propaganda aside, I still have the feeling there's a lack of quality journalism. But given this is largely demand-driven, yes. we can actually make a difference by changing our habits and what we consume. Well, yes, if, if we were to change our viewing habits and reward uh, other kinds of stories, the industry, with the exception of Fox and propaganda, would be exquisitely sensitive to it. They are not ideological in their pursuit of audiences except for Fox. So uh, in journalism reform circles, the, uh, the slogan, the mandate is to make the important interesting, to presume that the working of democracy can be told as a story, which doesn't trivialize the, the topic, but rather engages you and exposes you to the suspense and the conflict of democracy at work. Why is it that our views are not challenged in social networks? Is it still our own choice? For instance, the filters we apply because of homophily, or is it already personalization making this choice for us? Okay, oh wow. Um, I mean, in, in a way, this is an empirical question. So we, we, we know that homophily is a very strong force. There's a lot of research showing that people are ma mainly interacting with like-minded others. But there are many reasons underlying this. One is preference. Yeah? People enjoy this. Yeah, it, it's just more fun to talk to people who are like-minded. Um, and then there's this new force. And these are these personal, uh, personalization algorithms that are installed on many internet services. And they also have a good intention. Yeah, They want to uh, yeah, make people stay on these systems. That's good for the system, but it, it also entertains us. Yeah, and uh, so it's not necessarily, there's no bad intention behind it. The question is, what are the consequences of that? And if it is true that uh, uh, a too high level of homophily, yeah, a too strong exposure to like-minded others enhances uh, opinion polarization, increases polarization, perhaps even to a degree that, we, that our democratic system is uh, put under pressure, then we have to mend that. Then, yeah, then at this moment, uh, this technology turns into a problem. Um, the question is, how big is that problem? And for that, we don't really have an answer yet. So we know that uh, homophily is increased by, by these algorithms. Um, and we know that uh, this 
in principle has the potential to increase polarization. Um, whether it actually does, that's a big question. Yeah? One problem is, for instance, that we may see very small effects right now, but it could be, and this is what we learn from our formal models, is that uh, sometimes you see very little effect for a long time, but suddenly it's exploding. Yeah? Sometimes the system, a small change can tip a system as complicated as a, a, as a online social network, for instance, or democracy in general. Sometimes a, a small change can tip a system into a very different state, and then moving it back can be very complicated. Can liquid democracy help overcome political divides? Well, I uh, I hope so, and uh, to, to a good extent, I believe so. In the sense that, uh, given that liquid democracy really puts, uh, as we discussed earlier, the uh, the possibility of healthy deliberation back in the in the picture, and the possibility of uh, actually and the power of agenda setting back in the hands of uh, of uh, citizens and participants. Now, the, my hope would be that, you know, that's something that could bring, uh, that could bring this, could break these fault, fault lines and actually help society uh, to, to look be, beyond them and try to find, identify actually the, the core ideals, the core goals that are actually shared rather than the differences that are, um, uh, that somehow uh, brings us uh, take keeps us apart I think that's where liquid democracy uh, at to the degree that I understand it has the most promise in the US setting which is uh, in the local realm especially when the uh, politicians or elected officials involved are not running uh, as partisan uh, candidates, but rather uh, uh, their own platforms. Uh, I mean, here in Los Angeles, for example, we have a city council where the election, people may have partisan affiliations, but everybody is saying, vote for me because of who I am. Uh, and so when, when the disputes happen, right now there's a huge dispute over how to deal with the homelessness issue. This is not at all a partisan issue. Uh, uh, it, it's a, a dispute based on uh, uh, class and race and, and other issues, which tend to map to partisan uh, uh, interests, but at least it can be conducted uh, in a way that is not possible uh, on larger spheres. Topic-based delegations allow to split the scheme of representation into subject areas. Do you think that this can be instrumental for overcoming political fault lines and organizing new majorities? Yes, yes, you're right in pointing to that because it may very well be the case that by actually somehow repackaging all these, uh, the, by splitting those issues, uh, you somehow pull them out of the ideological attraction. You kind of perhaps force uh, participants and you know, citizens to really uh, discuss them for what they are, rather than uh, uh, than reflections of some some um, divisive uh, ideology. Yes, yes, but uh, I think we have the best chance for doing this at the local level because there people have a relationship with the services and the service deliverers and can hold them accountable and express their point of view, even through things like town halls and marches and so on. Whereas Washington uh, is so easy to demonize uh, and to turn into a cartoon. Talking about cooperatives beyond the aspect of participation and empowering members, can liquid democracy be helpful when it comes to power dynamics and majorities? Cooperatives today are are entertaining a lot of emerging kind of diverse multi-stakeholder structures. Some of them have very focused kind of product goals. Some of them have much more um, uh, kind of diverse goals as infrastructure, and they're having to navigate uh, many different kinds of voices. 
Um, but one thing that can be a real danger for them in that when they're dealing with complex governance challenges is factionalism, you know, creating a, an environment where they're relying on their particular kind of class identity as, you know, which section of the cooperative are they part of to determine how they might vote. Um, systems like liquid democracy could help us see more clearly what we might really have in common, um, help look across those class lines and, um, and you know, and recognize that that our our coalitions can be kind of broader and deeper than we might have otherwise seen. Do you think liquid democracy has the potential to break the iron law of oligarchy, or will we see new, better, more reasonable elites or elites more accountable just because power is less assured and very much depends on the track record? Yeah. Uh, uh. Optimistically, um, I would like to say yes, um, though I think there are still um, parts of liquid democracy that um, are, could fall in some of the, the traps or the, the, the issues that are still present in representative democracy. Opening up a direct vote, I think, for all um, citizens, if it be a nation or all community members if it's in a smaller community or all party members if it's in a political party. I think that itself really opens up um, the option for people who would vote directly on policy issues themselves to be able to be counted in those decisions. Um, though a part of my skepticism, and I think maybe the like general skepticism out there for people who are skeptical, would be that the delegation patterns would follow a very similar pattern to like a representative pattern. Um, like the, the pattern to which we elect representatives, the same uh, types of people would be the people who would amass deciding voting weight. Um, and I mean, the biggest, I guess, silver lining, I think maybe in the dismantling of the iron wolf the oligarchy is the, the instant recall component, the ability to, I guess, hold people a little more accountable um, instead of a fixed term uh, that they're elected as representatives. Um, I, as you said, I think of all the reasons in the novice expert problem, the, the track records strikes is something that would be particularly um, useful for the tools that use liquid democracy and more so useful to liquid democracy than um, is useful to many representative democracies. I still think there is a skepticism um, that exists um, as it does with any form of democracy and as it does with representative democracy that there's, um, that we might fall into the same patterns. Yeah. The iron law of oligarchy is a beautiful traditional sociological hypothesis. And um, so this is one of the things you learn in your first semester at the university if you study sociology. Um, so, and it's, uh, yeah, so on the one hand, it's, uh, it, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting for, for sociology because, because it's so classical. On the other hand, it's of course horrible if, if this is true, if, if, if this is really an iron law that you will always find. But let's face it, um, is there a lot of empirical support for it? I'm, I'm not sure. And I wouldn't say that, um, that the iron law of oligarchy should be understood as, 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 a, as a hypothesis that this is always going to happen. It's, I think it's, uh, we should understand this more as a, as a warning. It could happen. And we have to build and constantly rebuild our democracies in a way that we prevent the destruction of democracy. You've referred a couple of times to the the that famous iron law of oligarchy idea. This idea that that systems tend to drift um, by default toward a kind of oligarchic um, structure. I really think that the iron law of oligarchy is built into our context. It is a reflection of background patterns. Um, it's not something that is predetermined or that's necessary. And I get that um, from my exploration of, of one of the contexts where it occurs a lot, which is online communities. Um, and the reason it occurs, I've concluded, is that all of the tools 
uh, that people have at hand for moderating their communities, for managing them, assume oligarchic structure, right? And if you wanna build something other than oligarchy, you have to work three times as hard. Um, if we had tools available to us that, for instance, you know, by default encouraged us to do things like liquid democracy um, or, uh, or kind of lottery-based decision-making, um, I think that iron law would be much less strong. With authoritarian tendencies in ascendance, it is clearer than ever that democracy is not the default setting. Populism and the pandemic have hit democratic politics particularly hard. Trust is the glue that holds societies together, though, and in order to regain that citizen trust, politicians need to support new forms of engagement that are inclusive, transparent, and participatory. Let's face it, unless democratic leaders are open to innovative channels of inclusive, participatory citizen engagement, like liquid democracy, they might find themselves in an ever shrinking club. I am perhaps naive in hoping that people will come to understand that categories like true and false and real and unreal actually exist and are important. And that science is not the place that says what is always one or the other. Science is a process in which if you believe something, you agree that it is false if certain evidence appears, unlike, for example, religion in which nothing is ever falsifiable. So I, I am a, a dreamer in what Karl Popper called the open society and the principle of falsifiability in science. It doesn't have to be uh, conceived with those complicated academic terms, but uh, I think people natively, children are curious and try to figure out what's true and not true and move from magical thinking to rational thinking. And I would like to think that perhaps our second childhood is still ahead of us. My hope with liquid democracy is that it can show that we can do things differently. So we are at the moment in which uh, experiments in the in democratic decision-making like liquid democracy can show new, new ways in which we can organize the way we run our inst democratic institutions. And that's an important moment of the recollection that we become aware of the fact that things can be organized in a better way. So my hope is that uh, liquid democracy and the activity that you do, uh, Andreas, actually show us a new space of possibilities and, uh, we, and that we start really engaging with these possibilities using the toolbox of many sciences uh, from political science, sociology, uh, history, uh, computer science, artificial intelligence, uh, psychology, so that we can really bring all this immense breadth of expertise is to contribute to rethinking democratic institutions. And I think rethinking democracy is such a fantastic aim and really being able to bring the enthusiasm and the expertise of so many, from so many disciplinary angles can only be, uh, you know, it's a great achievement. And I think it's something that will have uh, an important impact uh, in the future. The way I view it, liquid democracy has the potential to at least help to solve the scalability problem of direct democracy. So one of the reasons why in most of the countries people use representative democracy is because direct democracy has an inherent uh, scalability issue because it's hard to make direct democracy in large scale. But liquid democracy at least has the hope or the potential to really use direct democracy at scale, let's say in the internet scale or in the modern scale. And I think that combined with machine learning techniques, liquid democracy really has the potential to somehow fix this scalability problem of direct democracy. I hope that more and more people experiment with liquid democracy and other civic participation tools within their local communities. This is crucial to understand which parts of these tools already work well in practice and where more research would be helpful.
I definitely think that liquid democracy has the potential to improve democratic decision making in many different scenarios. But I also think that participants may need some time in order to get used to it. What I would like to see more is small scale experimentation, just applying liquid democracy platforms in like clubs, organizations, schools, universities, in order to get used to it and in order to identify for which types of decisions and under which circumstances it works best. I think in our complex societies, we cannot really expect all citizens to be knowledgeable and interested in all political matters and questions. And having this delegation opportunity helps people to then really focus on the things that they really care about, where they really want to be directly involved in, and where they think they can make a meaningful, meaningful contribution, either because they have knowledge about the subject or because they are affected by this policy. You can have a, a quicker um, shift of power. That's the name. A lot of the time, I think, when I'm uh, explaining liquid democracy to people and trying to explain the idea to them, and they're like, why does it have this name? And I always think of it as like the liquidity of voting power. It's the, the ability of the voting power to very quickly and flexibly flow from um, people to other people in the way that matches who has the most um, expertise on a given decision. And we see that the technology is creating many wonderful things these days, but um, there's also the warning that uh, systems like yeah, online social networks and the algorithms installed there uh, can actually harm democratic debate. Yeah, because we're constantly exposed to people who are like-minded and uh, our opinions are being reinforced and opinion differences are increasing. Um, if that is true, we want to rebuild that technology. We want to build it in a way that it's not harming society, not harming democracy, but enhancing it. And that would be my my hope that we that we start this process, that we get the political support to and also the political pressure on on on, on these services to rebuild them, to to have the scientific research needed, the scientific research ne necessary to understand these systems and amend them in a way that they actually support uh, democracy. That's my hope. It's supposed to be a government by the people for the people. But I think a lot of times people still view us as two separate bodies. They view us as the representatives and then, you know, the us, the American people. And I think when we can strengthen those bonds, then there's a reminder that the government is us and we are the government. And we can do very powerful things through that, but it requires uh, give and take both ways. And so that's what I'm very passionate about. I think that that is my hope for the future. Um, but, I, I, you know, as I mentioned, I think it's going to take some work. With something like liquid democracy, with um, this and other emerging tools, we have the chance to reignite the um, sense of possibility of what democracy can be and to help people see ways of fitting participation into their everyday lives in a manageable and appropriate way. Um, and to trust each other better, uh, to trust themselves better, to be full participants, um, even in the context of societies that feel so complex and so overwhelming, um, uh, to recognize that we really can uh, have a voice. <laughs>